Okay, let's get started. Welcome to Spine Conference. Today we're going to discuss uh, cervical radiculopathy uh, that's going to be treated with ACDF. And um, Keith, can you do me a favor? Can you like maybe lower the light just a little bit so you can see the screen a little better? How's that? You guys can see well? Okay. So, um, we're going to do this case-based learning. This is a 56-year-old uh, woman whose chief complaint was left arm pain, cervical radiculopathy. Uh, she had pain and numbness in her left neck that radiated to her left thumb, left index finger, and left middle finger. It uh, started six months uh, prior to presentation, <clears throat> and she, during that time, had been doing meloxicam, flex roll, and physical therapy, and uh, it had not improved. <clears throat> Her past medical history, high blood pressure, diabetes, bilateral total knees, cholecystectomy, gout, diverticulosis, surgery twice, uh, medicines, metoprolol, statin, metformin, buspirone, deloxone. She's a right-hand dominant clerical worker for the county. Uh, she's uh, quit cigarette smoking 30 years ago. So does anybody want to uh, add, ask any questions about the history? So just on the basis of the history, uh, what uh, are your, your thoughts, just uh, uh, the character of her pain? Who can talk? Katie, you know everything. What do you think? <laughs> What's the character? Um, hey, finger one. So it sounds like she's got um, the, her symptoms all are on the left side, and they're in like a C6, C7 distribution. Yeah. Um, she, What's C6 again? Just, to, just so as C6 review. C6 would be um, going down to the um, thumb and index. And thumb and index ring? Yeah. And good, morning. Then, good morning, Dr. Right. Sexton. Yeah. And then C7 would be um, the middle finger. Middle finger, classically. Okay. Yeah. And um, uh, why isn't this carpal tunnel by symptoms? Um, so she she has the pain beginning in her neck that radiates all the way down her arm. Yeah. yeah. Any, any other questions so far? Um, so we know when the symptoms started. Six months. And we know that she's tried several conservative things without any significant improvement. Um, those were the things that I would be targeting at first. I'd like to know what her functional status, if she's had any weakness in her... Um, no significant... So on her exam, no significant weakness, but her symptoms are recreated with range of motion in the neck. So Mesfin is 56 years old, symptoms into her <clears throat> left thumb, index, middle finger for six months. She had meloxicam, flex roll, and uh, physical therapy. And uh, she's a diabetic. Those are the main things. Um, so on physical exam, she's 5 feet 7 inches, 251 pounds. Her BMI is almost 40. And uh, her symptoms are recreated with range of motion of the neck. Yeah? I was going to get a chance to run over the reading. Yes. So I was going to do that, do the case first, and then we'll do the reading. That way it's like, yeah, yeah thank you. it's in our minds. So, all right. So how do you, um, hey, Messman, how do you differentiate a, um, a neck problem from a shoulder problem? Like, uh, mostly C5 radiculopathy. Do you have any tricks? I mean, you look for the normal kind of impingement type symptoms on his hand. Uh, look for spurling. Sort of thing, look at films. Okay. So, and, and basically what I do is, um, if the symptoms can be recreated with the range of motion of the neck, then I think it's cervical. If the symptoms can be recreated with the range of motion of the shoulder, I think it's more shoulder. But sometimes it's both. Okay. So, um, Dr. Sexton is here. Dr. Sexton, can you um, go over the uh, x-rays for us? Sure. Um, well, I'd like to start with the technical so you all understand what a good radiograph is. And uh, so, I like collimation. Um, improves the image and decreases radiation to parts of the body that don't need radiating. So, whether these were collimated by the photography or by the x-ray, they're pretty well collimated. Uh, look at all the corners. I'll make sure there's not a pancose tumor. Uh, and uh, for alignment in the lateral, I look at the back of the mandible. Uh, so pretty close uh, this way and pretty good this way. So good, good radiographs, look, look around other than the spine, airway, and so forth. And then our usual spine stuff, the alignment, disc heights. Uh, you can get a sense of the dimension of the canal. Uh, uh, on the radiographs here, uh, there is some degenerative disc disease at, uh, five, especially in five six with posterior spurring. Another place you can look in the AP 
is the, uh, the uncinate uh, joints here, here, and here. So we have one, seven, six, five. Uh, at five, six, there are certainly some left lateral spurs. Was this, was this, were the symptoms left sided? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you can get an oblique, of course, to look at that. We have uh, an oblique. Okay, great. Um, so uh, yeah, all the spinous processes line up, no pancos, tumor, et cetera. That's a, that's a good trick for the mandible. That'll be good in the operating room to remember that. Okay, so here are the obliques. Um, well, you're, you're confirming uh, the uncinate osteophytes bilaterally at 5-6. Bilaterally at 5-6, encroaching the neural foramina. So. Does that, Katie, is that consistent with the exam? Uh, uncle osteophyte at C5, C6, would that explain C6 nerve root? Um, so C6 should be exit or the C6 nerve should be exiting above, so yeah, that's consistent with it. Okay, so next you came with a um, open MRI from Elkton. So would you mind, Dr. Sexton, explain? Sure. Well, um, one second, Heath, what, what angle did the foramen come off of in the cervical spine versus the lumbar spine, or is it the same? So if you think about the foramen, do they come out at the same angle? Um, they come so out uh, as they do in the lumbar. More sharply the cervical spine. Yeah. I don't know the number. Um, so if you... What do you, know, you I, what do you mean by that? So in the cervical spine versus the lumbar spine, the foramen are angled anteriorly by about 45 degrees versus the lumbar spine, they come out perfectly laterally. So on oh, a I lateral see. lumbar spine, if you go back to your lateral So if the foramen is like a tunnel, that's yeah, what you, it's, okay. That's right. You see the foramen on a lateral lumbar x-ray, whereas you don't see the foramen on a lateral cervical spine. So in order to see the foramen, you have to do an oblique, which is about a 45 degree angle, and you see it dead on, which is why the oblique shows your foramen on the cervical spine, but they don't in the lumbar spine. That makes sense? So you don't see the foramen here in the cervical spine, right? Correct. You can't. Because the angle that they come off. That's a good point. Okay, so uh, she came with an open MRI from Elkton. So, uh, Dr. Sexton, can you? Um, sure. Uh, go again, on the technical things? side, uh, sagittal. This is a, a fat saturating sequence, probably a stir sequence. Um, you, the first thing that strikes you is the image is a little blurry and. Uh, we have here nicely labeled this as an open MRI, but and, um, certainly I understand why people get open MRI. I don't have any beef at all. Uh, an MRI of this quality is way better than no MRI, way better. Um, but you can see that there are step-offs in, in the spinal cord, for instance, and that has to do with the, re the intrinsic resolution of a low field scanner. So just so you can identify, hey, I'm looking at a, a l an open scan. What, what did you say? How can you tell it's open again? What did you say, a step-off? Yeah, the. Uh, I I want to interrupt. I have a beef with open MRI. I can't stand them. <laughs> I, I can't see as well. Right, you can't. And, and well, I, I, my policy usually is I give people Valium, yep. usually 10 to 15 milligrams. Does anybody have any protocol for what you, how you deal with that? Give two, two five milligram tablets. Take one before MRI. If you still need to take a second one. I say 30 minutes. What do you tell them? I tell them if you know take it before you go to the MRI. When you get there, it's still claustrophobic. Take the second one. So I don't. And uh, of people who get Valium in this sort of um, regimen, uh, how many get through a, an open, a, a, sorry, a closed scan? Hi. Most do. Hi. Most, most of them do. do. Most Hi. Do. It's, Wonderful. Yeah. It's, it's impressive how, Wonderful. Yeah. how well it yeah, works. Yeah, most of them do. Very Wonderful. few can't can tolerate Valium. Yeah. Interesting. And it also sends a bigger scanner, like when we have up the Timonium, it's a little bigger, right. it's faster also. Right, so. right, right. So the, po the point is that the the newest scanners are not a lot bigger, but they're still significantly bigger. Uh, uh, and so, yeah, high, uh, high field MRI is now getting a little bit more patient friendly. The, uh, the, co the cord looks like it's got kind of ridges on it here, and uh, that's a result of the fact that um, the slices are thicker and, the, and uh, you can't get the, the detail of the high field, you can't get the gradient uh, resolution. So uh, this is a fat saturated sequence. We look at uh, the bone marrow, we can look at the soft tissues. 
Um, this is uh, not the best uh, sequence to look intrinsically at the chord if you're trying to make some sort of fine differentiation, but certainly this chord is impinged at 5, 6, and 6, 7 centrally, and, and uh, I don't see uh, chord edema. Okay, we have more images. Well, this is uh, with the uh, non-fat saturated T2 and shows the same. So I have some axial cuts and they're labeled. So just, right. just Paul, so this is a 56-year-old woman with a thumb index, middle finger, radiculopathy symptoms. So Dr. Sexton, you want to keep going? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, this is a T2 non-fat saturated. Again, you can look intrinsically at the cord. Uh, note the foramina go out forward and laterally, as we were talking about. I look for the um, high signal in the root sleeve, uh, and uh, if you could quibble about the left here, I wouldn't, I would call that normal. Uh, but that's, the money is the cord, space for the cord, and then do you see the triangles of the sle root sleeve going out into the foramen? That's interesting, Carl, I never looked at high signal in the root sleeve. Is that something you routinely, no one's ever commented on that in any of the reports of I'm actually sorry. high signal intensity in the root sleeve? I've, I've seen in the... In See, the, the CSF filled root sleeve. High intensity because of CSF. That's oh, all, that's oh, all saying I'm saying. CSF in the frame. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. That's all, it's a marker looked, for me. Okay, I thought you I, meant I focus the, looking for that triangle, root. particularly okay. on the yeah. left, uh, on our left, the patient's So right. that tells you there's no foraminal stenosis? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you see something like, well, bilaterally, you can see clearly that there's no foraminal stenosis from the, mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of reasons. There's fat, a little bit of fat in the foramen and that root sleeve. Mm -hmm. Can you see the angle at which the foramen are coming off? It's literally yes. like the 45. It's parallel to the lamina in the back. See that? I see. So you're not going to see a, the foramen in a lateral lecture. Okay, so let's keep going. C4, C5. So um, a teeny bit there on the left, I would call that mild, minimal to mild left foraminal narrowing. Okay, C5, C6. So different story here. Uh, the cord is deformed. Um, the CSF is effaced. Um, uh, so now I gotta a little bit eat my words on that foramen because if there if, if ever there was a nice looking root sleeve on on both sides, the left C5, 6 is is good looking. So um, I would have to report out no foraminal stenosis and, and mild canal stenosis, mild spinal cord impingement. We did see uh, Uncle Ossie fight on the oblique. I know. Though. So there must be someone that there, you there's don't, somewhere. You think the right this is, an open, is it it's an open study, and they often don't do the same number of slices through the disc level. So you, you might be kind of getting towards pedicle, yep. and you're seeing it better. Good let's, let's look at the oblique real quick. So yeah. definitely see 5, C6. There's looks, no doubt that those yeah. foramen, foramen are encroached. I mean, that's one more reason why you've got to take all this stuff into your brain and <laughs> come up with a decision. You know, you can't just rely on the MRI. So there's there's, yeah, there's three a, there's three axes yeah. for the C6 template, yeah. for the C6 C7 level. There's three levels, so I just want to go one at a time. So this sure. is C6 inferior template. Well, so this uh, this is to Justin's point that uh, the slice location, although it looked like it was pretty good for the frame, and this is this definitely shows what we're what we've been looking at. This, the, ad, this adds up. So this is C6 C7. Yeah. Even worse. Well, last one was C5 C6. Yeah. Okay. But that's that was our suspect level mm -hmm. until now, and C six C seven again. Yeah. Well, it looks like a soft disc herniation. A, a disc herniation. Mm -hmm. you can't bad. tell. Yeah. yeah. Can't tell. And C seven superior. So endplate. again, the blockiness of this image is a result of the low field. The okay. Problem so I have with the opens is that they charge the insurance companies the same amount. Yeah. So it's completely unethical. And the patients get so upset. When you tell them I can't see well, it yeah, just, it's it's yeah. it's really disturbing. But the problem is they come to you with the MRI. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a better open MRI. There's one that I tell my secretary send them to the best open MRI if you can because they're they really vary in quality. Mm -hmm. And I think Advanced has a pretty good open MRI. Which one? Uh, Timonium. Uh, I'm not sure where it is, but it uh, might be one. But there's one that's the, 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 the they they vary tremendously in their quality. Them to at least the, the best open MRI if they're going to require that. I totally agree. So this is uh, what this is just an axial cut um, with a video of a different sequence, just to give everybody an idea. But I want to I want to show something. Just just watch right here at C6, C7, where I think there's a disc herniation. Um, that's C5, C6, and C6, C7. You see how it's bright mm -hmm. there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So I think that's significant. Um, what do you guys think that means when the disc herniation is bright or super bright? I have my own theory. I don't know if I'm right. But I, I, I want to... More acute probably versus the dark it is, more calcified or... More, more water filled. Material. Yeah, and I think more likely to be absorbed, I think, versus a dark one. Because a dark one, I would think, is like annulus or, or ossified. And, um, and I frequently, I sometimes get a CAT scan because it helps me, I think, differentiate osteophyte versus soft disc. Do you guys have any policy for that, for when you get a CAT scan? Versus OPLL. If I think it's OPLL, I always get a, a CAT scan. I agree with that, but I agree also with this. The brighter, the more, more likely a soft disc herniation, the more likely acute, the more likely to resort spontaneously. But yeah, without surgery. So... Okay, so just to, just to summarize, a 56-year-old woman, left-sided symptoms only, thumb, index, middle finger, BMI is 40. So uh, she's failed six months of uh, non-operative treatment, so I think she's ready for surgery. And um, we're going to go over whatever it wants to do, but first Megan's going to give us a review. Where's Megan? Over here. Oh, a review of uh, cervical... <laughs> she was hiding. Ready? Cervical radiculopathy. Oh, wow. So... Um, Take it away, Megan. All right. Um, so one of the journal articles we read was the yellow journal article. It's really just a review of cervical radiculopathy. So I'm going to start with the basics. What is it? It's a pain radiating from the neck, um, usually in uh, an affected distribution. The exact location should typically follow a classic dermatomal or myotomal distribution, but it is important to note that especially in the upper, upper extremity compared to the lower extremity, it doesn't always fall, follow that pattern, and so that can be often confusing if you see it in the ER or something like that. And it often is self-limited, um, although there are surgical indications to, uh, that we'll discuss. The pathology can be either a lateral recess or foramal disc herniation. It can be due to loss of disc height from disc degeneration, that then you get the nearing of the foramen. You can also get uncovertebral osteophytes that then cause impingement in the foramen as well, uh, as well as facet hypertrophy. Um, we discussed a little bit about um, uh, what, how to differentiate if it's shoulder versus uh, neck, and the spurling sign is also very good where you try to extend and rotate towards the side of um, the pathology, and if that recreates the symptoms, then you're like, it's gonna come from the neck, not necessarily a peripheral neuropathy. Um, the most common nerve roots are C6 and C7. Um, uh, Sometimes uh, you will have that radiating pain, that's the most common, but you also can have uh, root irritation and just have upper trapezial and interscapular pain um, and, and no radicular pain, so you want to make sure about that as well. Um, uh, sorry, I'm going through my notes. So on physical examination, um, other motor neuron signs that you always want to look for to make sure that the cord is not impinged versus just a radiculopathy and to go over for that for interns. Like core compression, if you have a central disc herniation that's impinging on the core, that's when you get a motor neuron signs, which I'll go over. Whereas if you have a disc herniation or foramenal stenosis, that's impinging on your nerve root, which will give you the radicular signs. Other motor neuron signs that you can have is the Hoffman sign, where uh, you flick your middle finger and your thumb will uh, automatically flex. You can have your inverter radial reflex, where you do your brachioradialis reflex, but instead of getting the extension of your wrist, you're actually getting a flexion of the fingers. You can get clonus in the feet, Babinski sky in the feet, you can have gait instability or di difficulty with manual dexterity. And then we already talked about the spurling sign. Um, the differential diagnosis we always want to talk about is the peripheral neuropathies, which we already discussed. You can have a brachial uh, plexus injury. You can have the Parsons turner syndrome, as well as just tendinopathies in the shoulder and elbow and the forearm if you're having um, pain within that upper extremity. Although I haven't seen many people get it, they do talk about the EMG. So if you're having trouble distinguishing whether it's a peripheral versus a central problem, um, you can get an EMG and that can help differentiate. As well as you can always do diagnostic uh, injections within a uh, typical nerve root to see if that relieves the pain. Non-surgical management, you could do, there's a lot of variety of different things. There's immobilization, just for, an, if you have like an acute disc herniation, you can immobilize just for one or two weeks to help um, decrease the inflammation, but you don't want to do it for long term, otherwise you get muscular atrophy within the cervical neck. You can also do home traction, although um, that's kind of debated. You can do NSAIDs. You can also do uh, nerve agents like gabapentin or Lyrica. They also talked about in here amitriptyline uh, particularly, although I have not seen anybody use that. 
For acute uh, symptoms, you can use your medical dose pack, you use physical therapy. There's also cervical manipulation that uh, people can do, although that should be avoided in anybody that you could have upper motor neuron signs because you don't want to do it in a myelopathic patient. And then also the steroid injections that also can be um, both therapeutic and diagnostic if you're having difficulties. Uh, it then went into the cervical treatments. Um, indications uh, would be severe or progressive neurological deficits, either they talked about weakness or numbness, or if you just had significant pain that failed uh, you know, a, a good trial of conservative treatment. So they talked about ACDF, uh, total disc replacement in, in this article, um, and then I can talk about the two articles that talked about a posterior approach as well. ACDF benefits allows direct removal of the lesion, which is where you're getting the compression either from the osteophytes or from um, the disc. Um, it allows you to open up the disc and allows an indirect decompression of the foramen. Um, the fusion of the neck helps prevent any kind of axial neck pain that you could have postoperatively. Uh, anterior approach versus the posterior approach has a lower risk of infection and wound complications. Um, it's also people say better cosmetically. And you also can have less postoperative pain because you're not going through all the muscle because it's just through a, um, an intermuscular plane. Um, the di disadvantages, you all, because you're going through the anterior aspect, you have speech and swelling complications because of the uh, laryngeal nerve. Um, and you also can have risk of pseudoarthrosis and obviously risk of adjacent segment disease. Um, they typically talk, anytime we're talk, looking at OID or anything like that, they always talk, say like it's a one to two, like ACDF is indicated for like a one to two level uh, fusion. Um, but really you can do a three level ACDF. Um, uh, and they, they, I think that they said in here was that before is historically a three level ACDF was considered suboptimal. Um, but with new uh, plating techniques and, th and grafting, they think that now it's fine to do a three-level uh, ACDF, but just for historical purposes for OID. So why, why, why is that? Why are you saying they shouldn't do an ACDF at three levels? So I, this is my question. I think non-union, non, they're alluding to non-union risks. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Well, well, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Correct. Know, yeah. the, it is the non-union risk if you have a higher the right. higher levels. Um, what, what percent on you have they in the literature implying that they do three level ACF? Um, I'm not sure. I think it's a five percent non union rate for like a one to two. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing it's I mean, 50 10 or 15. Uh, at one level, at one of the levels, if you do three level that back in the poster, yeah. yeah, that's what the literature is talking about. Um, uh, and anterior, it also, one of the benefits that also helps give you, if you need a little bit of more lower doses, um, you can get a little bit more low doses as well going anteriorly. Then they talked about a total disc replacement. Um, the advantages of that, typically we're doing those, uh, my understanding is a little bit younger patients, and it's to help to maintain motion. Um, it avoids a non-union because you're not fusing, um, as well as you're avoiding any kind of uh, plate and screw complications like a back out, esophageal erosion, or um, ossification around the plate. The risk though on uh, the complications is if you have device failure, which can happen, um, as well as since you're not fusing, you still have motion, you can still get the risk of developing osteophytes and then later recurrent of your radiculopathy. Um, and then the posterior decompression you can do. Um, it also avoids fusion, which is the advantage, the disadvantage is that you have a higher uh, um, uh, infection rate going posteriorly. Um, you cannot you don't take care of the pathology that's anterior, so that's the disc, you don't restore disc height. You also have the risk of incomplete de decompression based on where your disc herniation is. If it's a little bit too far lateral, you would risk um, not getting a full decompression. Um, they talked about that there's still unresolved issue is how to determine when and who is recommended for surgery and who's not going to be, um, whose symptoms will not resolve with conservative treatment. That tip, but they generally have a high res, uh, resolution rate with just non, non-operative treatment. Um, there's two articles that I'll just quickly go over, we went over. Um, one looked at the course of prognostic factors of symptomatic cervical disc herniation with radiculopathy. It was a symptomatic review. So it's only looking at disc herniation causing radiculopathy, not these degenerative processes. Um, they looked at the risk factors were male, tobacco use, heavy lifting, like any kind of diving board, um, uh, 
sport even or occupation. Um, they looked at the course of cervical radiculopathy. They found that symptomatic cervical disc creation with the radiculopathy is favorable. Few patients actually experience long-term disability. Improvements typically occur within the first four to six months uh, post onset. Uh, time to completion, uh, up to complete recovery, it usually is like two to two and a half years, which I thought was pretty long. Um, and it, typically, I don't think we, if they weren't recovered by several months, then we'd be operating already. Um, improvements maintain, were actually maintained over two to three years, and there was a 22% recurrence rate at two, and a, two to two and a half years. And no one in this, what, this study developed persistent cervical herniation. Uh, had myelopathy or a progressive neurological deficit of follow-up. Um, the only prognostic factor they found was workers' compensation had poor prog uh, prognosis in traumatic cervical disc herniations, not just in all cervical disc herniations. Um, and they found that there was a similar co course that I just described for both axial neck pain and lumbar disc herniations, so it all is very similar. The other article, it looked at uh, does neck pain function and range of motion differ from after ACDF total disc replacement in a posterior cervical frame anatomy. Um, all of them had a significant, they found all had a significant improvement, clinical improvement after surgery. The satisfaction was lower in the posterior cervical frame anatomy compared to ACDF in total disc replacement, but that was actually not statistically significant. Um, they found that the operated segment, the upper and lower segments of range of motion was better in the total disc replacement and the posterior cervical frame anatomy compared to AC, ACDF, but that was not statistically significant. The only thing that was statistically significant was the whole cervical range of motion uh, was significantly more, uh, was higher in the total disc replacement, which makes sense since that's one of the indications. Some things that they didn't mention that I thought was interesting um, was the complication rate in their table. It showed that ACDF was the lowest complication rate and the total disc replacement was the highest complication rate of like 18%. So it was interesting they didn't even mention that. Um, they also noticed that the total disc replacement patients uh, were, had a statistically significant age difference when they were younger. Makes sense, that's one of the indications is maintain motion in a younger patient population. Um, and the reoperation was higher in the posterior cervical frame and group and the lowest in the ACDF group. Um, but the reop, re, which they thought was actually different from other studies that had shown that uh, the reoperation rate was comparable between an ACDF and a uh, posterior cervical frame and which was at 5%. But this one they showed a higher reoperation in the posterior approach. Um, that's it. So let me just make one comment that uh, when you look at the total disc replacement literature and head-to-head uh, -head studies against ACDF, the reoperation rate at the index level was lower on the total disc replacements and uh, the incidence of, of additional surgery going out, now they have up seven-year data, has clearly shown the superiority with total disc replacement mm -hmm. over uh, fusion. And it's the only, one of the only procedures where there is an FDA indication stating superiority as opposed to as good, which a lot of the studies were done, the early uh, studies. That's for one and two level? Probably. One level. And uh, I'm not sure that the two level has superiority uh, indication, just you may know that with OBC, does it? It does, yeah. Superiority over two, two level fusion? Greater, greater distance of improvement compared to the same Okay, area. so both. So, yes. Okay. Any other comments? About very good job, Megan. I would say the only other comment I would make in terms of return to work. So, cervical sort of disc arthroplasty has shown the same study statistically significant and faster return to work, which makes sense, right? You don't have to put on the rigid collar and you don't have to wait for a fusion to take, depending on the job. Is there, we talk about superiority for uh, uh, CDR versus. Uh, ACDF, is there any concern uh, about the life of the prosthesis uh, long term? I know we don't have great long term data. I think there is always concern when there's a motion device, you know, like Steve Ludwig at Maryland says, there's no such thing as a perpetual motion machine. Um, but in Europe, um, where they're probably 10 years ahead, there's not been reported multiple failures because of wear and tear on the device. Remember, the load is so much less than the knee or the hip. 
also the volumetric wear is dramatically less, like you know, logarithmically less, because it's only about five to ten degrees of motion per level compared to a hip or a knee where it's close to 180 degrees. So we're not seeing osteolysis or wear degree or failures of the device, um, but it is a concern over a 40, 50 year time span potentially. What I see in the longer term patients is not wear, is that like in most patients, the cervical spine becomes spondylotic and you end up you know, getting less and less motion at the arthroplasty level and they end up using that level if you go out long enough. So I think they're just going to lock down like a normal disc locks down all the time. Okay. Any other comments? So um, this patient had, I think, combination of um, uh, an acute soft disc herniation uh, and also an uncle osteophyte at C5, C6. And um, uh, I won't go into that slide. But just uh, it's common to have abnormalities in your spine and be asymptomatic. So this is an article from 2015. How many people have disc bulges in asymptomatic patients? Almost everybody. Um, and spinal cord compression, you can see here by decade, uh, 50, 60, 70, so around 10 to 15 percent, male more than female. So it's common, and these are asymptomatic patients. Um, and just as a review, C6 is thumb, index, finger, uh, wrist extension. Uh, C7 is wrist flexion, triceps tendon, mostly middle finger. And uh, I, I thought this is just a good slide. Just uh, some patient with acute disc herniations present with their hand on their head, <laughs> which uh, have you guys seen that before? And uh, it decreases the um, um, course of the nerve, and uh, the, the nerve is more slack with your hand on your head. And you can see on the cartoon on the left how it makes sense. If you put your hand over your head, uh, it takes the pressure off the nerve. So a lot of people um, come in like that. Okay, so what, uh, what is everyone's thoughts about this case? What, how would you approach this patient, a uh, 56-year-old woman with um, two levels of stenosis? Um, looks like C5, C6 is chronic, um, uh, and C6, C7 looks more acute. Would you do one? Would you do both? Two-level disc herniation, posterior frame anatomies, posterior laminectomy fusion, two-level ACDF. Any um, takers? Comments? I'll start with that after, after I leave. Yeah. Um, the traditional treatment for ACDF would be a two level ACDF if you're gonna if you're gonna do six seven with the degenerative five six and some bony foramenal stenosis. The traditional treatment is a two level ACDF. I think with the TDR technology, uh, at this point I would just do a TDR at six seven and ignore five six at the asymptomatic level. Uh, some people would do two level, probably just you probably do a two level TDR, uh, which I think is reasonable. Uh, but I would do a one level TDR just at the symptomatic level. Can I ask a question? Is there, I know it's mostly out of Asia, but there's some of those hybrid studies that you do now, or do you like one level ACDR? Sure, level? but the issue is do you really need to fuse, and then, then you're running into the issue of increasing the chance of adjacent level by fusing one level. I can tell you that there was a patient that I had in one of our study groups, and I, I was one of the IDE sites 15 years ago with uh, one of the implants, and I had a patient who came in who had a very degenerative 5-6 level and a big herniation of 6-7, and I debated whether to put her in the study, but we did, and we did the TDR, and she wound up getting um, randomized to TDR, and, and I, she's now out over 10 years and has done fine. So I think, you know, if you're of the, of the mindset that you're going to maintain the movement at that segment and the study show biomechanically is pretty close to normal movement, um, it, then, you know, why not just treat the symptomatic level and try to avoid the fusion? If she winds up needing a fusion of 5-6 later on, then you just do the fusion then. Yeah, right. I also think as far as the hybrids go, and I've done several now, uh, probably 20, 25 cases of hybrids. I generally think you have to put a three or four level. Uh, because to me, a three level fusion is much more noticeable in terms of loss of range of motion for patients than a one or two level where there's almost no difference in the pre-closed up motion. 
Um, so if there's someone who's got a three level disease process, you feel like all levels have to be treated, then either a single level fusion and two level TDR, two level fusion and one level TDR, and you're doing the TDR at the level that has the most mobility. In this case, without flexion extension, it's hard for me to comment on whether or not I do a TDR or not. Um, but assuming the 5 6 level moved well on flexion extension, I'm sure 6 7 does. Um, I generally would do both, especially adjacent segments, because I'm worried that if I miss a level, then the patient may not be fully satisfied. Um, and it's hard to know if it's 6 and 7. There's so many overlapping dermatomes. Um, so I think. I would tend to do both levels, whether it was a two-level fusion or two-level uh, disc replacement. Um, I'm not a big fan of posterior base surgery, um, unless it's truly a soft, single-level disc herniation in a young person. Um, maybe it's just me, but I feel like those patients, they're harder to get better. Um, there's a higher risk for nerve injury. You gotta manipulate the nerve to get the disc out. It's a more annoying procedure for me, more stressful for me. You talk of frame anatomy, right? Frame anatomy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other comments? Anybody else? Thoughts? I would be more likely to go anteriorly and do both levels. Mainly because uh, you said presenting symptoms were consistent more with the C6. Thumb, index, middle finger, so C6 and so C7. I, so I really want to address that 5 6 level as well. Mm -hmm. I've been leaning more and more away from using anterior surgical plates and some of these uh, standalone interbody devices and perfusion um, are really robust uh, titanium sprayed and coated. Some of them are 3D printed and uh, have had good success. I, I stopped doing single level plates probably five or six years ago, even perfusions, and I've just been using standalones. And now I've started expanding that to doing two levels. What do you put in a standalone when you do a single level standalone? It's a peak in the body uh, that's tight sprayed. Uh, and I'll use some type of alibi. I'll typically use trimming to work with this. And the results will be great. And you, and you remove all the potential complications related to an anterior plate. Then those complications are what mostly? Dysphagia? Dysphagia. Okay, I think we got it. Brad, any thoughts? Yeah, this would be a two-level ACDF for me. Uh, I think in John Reed's done studies where he's trying to look at differentiating a C6 versus a C7 radiculopathy, and there's so much overlap there that clinically it's, it's extremely difficult to do given the pathology of both levels. I think the more bulletproof operation would be to address both. And, and uh, in my hands, I would do an ACDF here. Okay, any other comments? Just keep moving. So um, I did a two-level ACDF. Um, those are my, and uh, I have a video. I just wanted to go over the video because I know Paul likes videos, but he's gonna leave. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh yeah, it worked. So th this is the first time I did the video through YouTube. So you can insert a YouTube video into PowerPoint, which I don't know if anybody cares. But there, I, I just have a first a couple comments. Is when there's a big discrimination. I remove a lot of end plate, and the reason is, uh, and I usually take away about two or three millimeters the size of the burr, because I think it's safer and easier to remove the disc. It gives you more space. And then uh, just the next steps is once you get close to the canal, the way that I do is I, and, I, and I'm curious how everyone else does it, is I, rem I get down to the dura, the sh very shiny dura, and I feel it makes it easier, because then you know where the dura is. And this is, this is a, you can see the, the, of the large disc fragment at C6, C7. I like see, the super slow-mo. You yeah. like that? Yeah. <laughs> it's like you, it looks like a dinosaur. <laughs> yeah, see, it makes it dramatic. <laughs> so you saw that. And it, that was a very big uh, disc fragment. And interestingly, she had three large disc fragments. Um, uh, and the MRI, I, I have found in my, in my practice, it doesn't tell you exactly what you'll find but it just tells you where to go, sort of. And the exact details, the MRI is not capable of doing that. So um, this is just more of the 1B curette. Um, uh, after I find the dura, I keep um, on that plane and I just keep pulling upwards uh, and uh, feeling um, 
uh, behind the vertebral body to make sure I got all the disc fragments. Um, so those are the only comments I have. Does anybody else want to uh, discuss their technique at all on um, uh, decompressions? Yeah, I kind of do the same thing with the angle curette to get behind the PLL. I like to take out the entirety of the PLL from uncus to uncus. So I usually start by going back and getting the uncus out laterally first, and then gives me a sense of the width of the canal. And then, um, and then take out the PLL and show them here. How do you prove you're, you have enough space in your uncus? I mean, I usually use a 3B curette. And yeah, if I can so I'll either use a nerve hook um, to make sure I can kind of roll it side to side, sort of windshield wiper it, or I'll use a, a 3O micro curette, angled micro curette out the foramen uh, to make sure um, it's, it's decompressed. Any other, Nestor, do you have any other tricks or comments? I'll usually get a keratin punch, and if I can get a true punch out of the frame, it's decompressed. And one other point uh, to the residents, that if you see the herniation on the left side, if you are going from ventral to dorsal down across the disc, you, know, you don't want to go in on that left side, because you're going to displace that disc further posterior to the quarter. So you want to enter the epidural space through the PLL at a relatively normal area, if you've got a normal area. And it's not you. You'll enter this patient here as, as spirited, either in the middle or on the contralateral side, and then you go from normal to abnormal to scoop it. Just like a tumor, right? So when you remove a tumor, you get all the way around it, and then and then you remove it. So it's sa same as a big disc herniation. You're saying go, try to get all the way around it, and then it just comes out by itself, a lot easier and safer. That's a very good point. Um, okay, I think any other comments or questions? So um, this is just a post-op. I did a two-level ACDF, and we could get into the um, different options. But So that's it. So any other questions or comments about cervical radiculopathy? How long we should we let people be treated non-operatively before you consider surgery? What are some of the clinical factors that go into your decision-making when you operate? What do you think you um, so I think if there's any improvement that's happening, I think that it's worth continuing. Um, I think that patient support and patient eagerness to either have the, the procedure or not plays a really large role because if you're kind of pushing someone to have a procedure they don't want to have, then it's not a good setup for success. Um, I think that exhausting um, each of the different non-operative treatments is important as well. So if they're, you know, failing physical therapy and things like that, then um, attempting an injection would be reasonable. Um, and just kind of however long it takes to work through all of those things before the person is ready for surgery. So I'm a painter, 50, got a couple kids that are, you know, pre-college, and I come to you and I've had pain in my shoulder and and weakness in my deltoid for a month. Um, so I think since it's not in a common scenario. In this scenario you're a painter and so that's your livelihood and especially if it's your dominant hand then you're gonna want to get back to full function as soon as you can. Uh -huh. uh, which I think kind of goes back to like patient patient's eagerness to get something done okay, as well. Just so you know I'm just asking you whatever you think is best doc then get them back to work as soon as they can. So they operate tomorrow? Um, Thumbs up. I got three space tomorrow. So four, four weeks, the painter has had four weeks, the painter has had four weeks of nostalgia and therapy. Mm -hmm. Four weeks. I'd really rather so, not have surgery. You know, I got summer, I got a trip to the Outer Banks with my family. Get back at the beginning of August. What can you know? What can I do? Right? This comes up all the time. I I feel like and I I feel like I read a paper that said that the long the length of time that someone has a disc herniation does not affect their ultimate outcome. Um, but I that was a while ago. Um, but but people can go people can go crazy with pain too. Though. Right. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so you say, look, you know what, let's try a medball dose pack. You try, you go on your trip, okay, I'm going to see you back in a month. We'll see how things are going. And then your off service comes in and sees Megan. 
And now it's uh, they say, look, you know, my pain is so much better. Thanks for the dose pack. Had a great time. But my shoulder is still really weak. And two over five deltoid power. They can move it. They can lift it. They can't get it over feet and gravity. No pain now. Pain is better. But they're still weak. Has the weakness progressed? What was your exam? No, it's the same as it was. At least on Katie's exam. That's what she said on her (laughs) note reading at EMR. Um, So they're not having any symptoms. My. um, They're not having any pain. Do we. Is the MRI, do we have an MRI? Do we see if it's yeah, soft? Yeah, so there's Is a disc herniation. Yep, C5-6, 50 year old C5-6 with a, looks like a soft disc, but there's some degenerative disc disease there. He's 50, or he's 50. So my, two months if in. it had been progressive, like it was three out of five, and now it's two out of five, I would have said definitely let's, I think that we should recommend surgery so that we have any more progression of neurological. Right. Deficit, you see but progression on the OITE and anything neurologically that equals surgery. Yeah. Here, if it's equal and they are still able to pain and it's not affecting their life and they still can lift their shoulder and do the things that they want to do, then I'd say let's continue non-operative because I would think that it could, your disc, I think it can take up to 12 months to resort. Um, and so we would continue to watch her and if there's any more progression, we'd definitely go back. Um, but the thing is, she's already two out of five, and if you go to surgery now, there's no guarantee that you're going to get that motor function back. So if they're not having pain, it's not interfering with their life. Then but I they would can't work because they're paining. Oh, okay, so they can't work. Can't work. Out of work for two months because they can't pain. But they have no pain now. Painless weakness. Two I months would, out. If they can't work, then I would s- explain the options. It would be a patient uh, physician combined decision, but I'd recommend that. If we do surgery, there is a possibility that I come back, but there's a possibility, a true possibility that it won't. And if it can't work, um, then we can try surgery, see if it comes back, but them understanding it may not come back with surgery. Mm-hmm. That's what I'd say. And what do you think, Brad or Spira? Like, what, at what point do you pull the trigger on someone who's weak? Like, is there something that you guys use? I wanted to make a comment. Is uh, when I take care of patients, I use the analogy of a crescendo or de- crescendo or decrescendo. So if they think it's a decrescendo of symptoms, mm-hmm. I say keep doing what we're doing. But if if they've plateaued, you start thinking maybe surgery. Mm-hmm. Um, so your case is a weakness, persistent weakness of your deltoid after mm-hmm. two months, mm-hmm. uh, and it's not improving. I would think of surgery. Um, but I, I usually, like Megan says, I think the, the key now is shared decision. So talk mm-hmm. about it, mm-hmm. and then yeah. you have your opinion. Yeah. But yeah. I'm a surgeon. I tell patients, look, I'm a surgeon, so I usually tend to do surgeries because that's what I do. <laughs> and you talk to Dr. Sexton, he probably take a picture. Yeah. <laughs> more, in, more imaging. Yeah. Get another shot. So you have to. You have to think about that. We're incentivized. <laughs> what about an injection in someone who's weak? What's the efficacy there? You know, they're no longer in pain. But Doc, can you do an injection? Won't that help with strength? What do you think? What do you tell them there? I don't know any data on it, but I would guess that it's not. I would think the pain and the radiculopathy that they feel is due to inflammation around the, the nerve. Um, whereas the actual compression is what's causing the weakness and the, the steroid injection is not going to treat the compression, it's just mm-hmm. treating the inflammation and the pain. Um, so I do not think that is something that would help. I don't know if you have a pain on Carlton, but I generally think of the injection as really a pain procedure, probably mm-hmm. not something that's going to affect the motor right. issue as much. Right. So I had this exact patient yesterday, it wasn't for a cervical disc, but for a for a lumbar disc, it was an S1 disc herniation. They couldn't uh, push off. There was very little gastroc strength, two out of five. But it was painless. And you know, I told them that um, you know we can try a shot. I have seen patients that have had an injection done, and their pain is and their strength has gotten better. But I think those are really more for the patients.